welcome back to the Millionaire Choice Show, and I'm your host, Tony Bradshaw, and I have with me a good friend that I've come to know this year uh, through COVID and everything that's been going on, and he's an acquaintance of another friend of mine. You may have caught the show by Chris Barfield, the millionaire the millionaire marshal uh, that was on several episodes ago. Well, today we have his counterpart, Cordell Frazier, who is a newly minted millionaire marshal. And so I'm excited to you know, share some of the ideas and thoughts that, that Cordell is going to have for us today on the show uh, on his journey to become a millionaire. Cordell, welcome. Oh, welcome. Thank, thank you for having me, um, Tony. Pleasure now, to be here. Yeah, yeah. I'm so excited to talk to you. You know, we haven't known each other that long, but the few for the few times we've been able to chat, it's been real fun. And uh, I'm going to be really excited for you to share some of the crazy things you've done uh, with, as you figured out how to do this thing, you know, called becoming a millionaire, because you didn't go a traditional orthodox route to that as you were learning. But before we get into that stuff, um, you didn't grow up in a wealthy family. You know, you grew up in a, a lower income family, probably struggling even more than I did. Uh, with finances and family. So I want to go through a little bit of that uh, because, you know, part of this show is really helping people understand that it doesn't matter where you come from, you can still do this thing called becoming a millionaire. Exactly, exactly. Uh, yes, I was born in Chicago, um, Illinois, back in 73. Uh, my mother moved to uh, Macomb, Mississippi in 1979, where I, you know, basically grew up in Mississippi um, under single parent household. Um, Graduated high school, went to a junior college for a little while, and then decided to join the military, uh, Army Reserves. So I went off to the Army Reserves and then came back and uh, developed a love for law enforcement, where I eventually became a Jackson, Mississippi police officer. Yeah, so uh, when you were a kid growing up in Mississippi, you know, it's not you think about New York, you think about California, you think about these states that got all this money or supposedly have all this money, right? And uh, you don't think of Mississippi as being one of those rich states. So what were some of the hardships you had to face, you know, single-parent home, boy in Mississippi? Well, you know, like I said, like in Macomb, Mississippi, is a very small town. Um, job availability was very limited. So uh, my only way out of there was to uh, join the military, basically, to um, get a new perspective on life and um, develop some discipline uh, inside myself. You know, without growing up without a father, you know, I needed a little discipline in my life. And so the military gave me an opportunity to uh, instill some discipline inside myself. Now, that's interesting. I've not heard that before on the show here, but uh, that, that is a, a, a big piece of that. It's actually part of millionaire key number one, which is you can't build or keep wealth if you don't develop strong character. And self-discipline is one of those character traits that you need. And so it's interesting that just as a young guy coming out of high school that you started realizing, hey, I need to develop some discipline. And uh, so you were embracing one of those first principles that I teach about. Exactly, because if you got to have the discipline to uh, put uh, money places where it's going to grow and, and, and not touch it so it can work for you instead of you working for money all the time. So you went, uh, when you get in, got into the military, uh, you said the Army Reserves. Did you ever get deployed? Uh, yes, I, I, I got deployed for the first time in 2003 to Iraq to fight the um, Iraqi war in 2003, and then I went back a second time 2010, 2011. Gotcha. And then it was after 2011. Is that when you got into the law enforcement side of things? Well, uh, I was I was into law enforcement in 2003 when I went the first time. I was uh, employed by the um, Jackson, Mississippi Police Department. And then 2005 is when I got employed with the uh, United States Marshal Service. Oh, awesome. In 2005. So you've been in there 15 years now, huh? Exactly. Oh, awesome. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And so I think that's a that's a key point, too, is because, you know, you know, police officers, contrary to what people may think, they don't get paid a lot, do they? No, we don't. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and you get paid a little bit more as a U.S. Marshal, but but uh, it's not like you're making like uh, double six figures up uh, out there, you know, like some of these corporate guys are. So uh, no. you've really had a, a not I don't want to say a small income, but uh, not some big fat lucrative income. You've had a, a modest income, exactly. and you've been able to turn this into. Now, um, did you always think you could build wealth, or did you kind of when did you kind of figure out that you could you know get away from this kind of lower income? place and then start building some wealth at, at first I, my, my main goal was to um just save um portions of my uh, paycheck every every pay period you know my grandmother had taught me that when i was a child just to save my money but you know it, the, the turning point for me is when um i was watching the presidential election with uh, when um mitt romney when mitt romney was running for president 
And I remember uh, the commentator saying that he, he didn't have income. He, he had capital gains. So that kind of sparked the interest in me. I'm like, whoa, you know, in my mind, everybody, you know, pay income tax. So, so now I started, you know, researching what capital gains meant. And so basically what I found out is that, you know, that's when you allow your money to make money for you. And I'm like, wow, man, that, that's, that's, that's awesome. You know, you don't have to work with this money. The money works for you. So, so I, I remember the first time when I, I uh, received three cents dividends from a stock that I, I purchased. And I, I thought that was like one of the most awesome things in the world. I, I didn't do anything for this three cents. It was just deposited into my account. So that, that, that sparked a drive inside of me, you know. Yeah. And, and uh, how were you when that happened for the first time? I was probably 38. Yeah. I was probably 38. Yeah, so yeah. so not young, not young, but uh, no. yeah. I get, so you kind of got started a little bit late, didn't you? It's, I, exactly, I did. Uh, the, the most important thing is that I, I I developed some good saving habits in my twenties. So so I had some, some some comfortable saving in the bank, but what I had to do was change my mindset to realize that I wasn't going to be able to save myself into wealth. I was going to have to take that money and, and reallocate it in, in, in some other asset in order to generate wealth at a faster rate because I, I, I wasn't going to be able to work my way into wealth. So, so that was a very pivotal point in my life when I made that decision. Yeah, I think that's a that's great to to say it that way. I love the way you said it because I think uh, a lot of people they don't ever you know take the plunge to actually take time to learn more about their money. You know, millionaire key number three, get money smart. And you so you started getting money smart at a later time, but you had already exactly. started being being frugal. But frugal being frugal is not going to make you uh, create wealth. It's not going to get you to where you need to be. You got to figure out how to multiply that money. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, you were 38 when you kind of started on that journey, right? And so now yes. you're pushing. Are you 50 yet? I'm 47. 47. I was aging 47. you a little bit. I, I just turned 50 just a few few weeks ago. So uh, we're kind of in the same ballpark. But uh, what I love about that is what you just told me is from 38 to 47, it took you a little bit less than 10 years to become a millionaire once you decided to do it. Exactly. And when I was 38, I knew I wanted to be financially um, stable, but but I had to put a dollar amount on that, you know, because that, that can mean different things for different people. So in my mind, I'll say, you know, if I can make it to a, a million dollars of, of net worth, that, that, that could be a comfortable amount of money and assets that, that maybe can take me throughout my life. So, so I said, well, I'm going to give myself to 50 to become a millionaire at 50, but lo and behold, I made it at 57. So I'm, I'm very thankful and grateful for that. Yeah. And I think, man, wow, that's, that's amazing to me. And what I've kind of started doing since I've started talking to more millionaires on the show and just kind of getting their stories is it, it feels like it takes about 15 years. I was telling somebody today on the phone, uh, you know, if you're, I had one guy that I've talked to that was five years old and he's like, ah, I want that candy bar. My mom told me I can't get that candy bar because she didn't have the money to buy it. He's like, I don't want to live like that. I don't want to like ha to try to scrape money together for candy bars. I want to be wealthy. And he became a millionaire at age 25. Um, I talked to wow. a young lady just, yeah, let's talk to a young lady. She grew up in a family that knew how to manage money. Uh, she's 29 years old and it's got a net worth of 750 grand. Um, and then others that get there by 30. So, you know, what I'm finding is when people start to understand this principle of wealth and start doing the, making the right decisions, it takes around 15 years or so. And what you just told me is it only took you nine, it took you nine years to get there. Now, did you start with? Uh, you said you had some savings built up. How much did you have built up? Um, probably in the range from fifty to seventy-five k. And 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 what I did was just I took some of that money and and and, and distributed it into two or three different sectors: um, real estate, um, stocks, bonds, and and, and Bitcoin. It, it, it's my major four. Uh, investment tools that I use. Yeah, and and so 
uh, not knowing a whole lot at the time, how did you actually go about getting started? Like, and, and let me say this, uh, you didn't start from like zero. You had, you had a frugal lifestyle before, which allowed you to accumulate that 75 grand, but from the time, but from the time, so you kind of set yourself up for success. And then you said, Oh, you know, I can become wealthy. I don't just have to save money. Exactly. Once I realized the difference between being rich and being wealthy, then I said, well, I would much more rather be wealthy than rich. And, and, and the reason I say that is because when you're wealthy, you have um, assets that are going to continue to make you money as, versus, as opposed to being rich. You know, if you start off with a million dollars, somebody gave you a million dollars in cash, as soon as you spend a dollar, you're going back the other way. But if you have a million dollars in assets that's generating wealth for you, only thing you have to do is just let that money continue to work and your wealth is going to continue to build as opposed to being rich and you don't have a lot of assets. Then every time you pay your bills, your mortgage, car payments or what, or, or what have you, your wealth is, is going back in a negative way instead yeah. of growth. Yeah. Yeah, I love your story about like I had I think about I'm thinking about you as this uh let's say twenty something year old guy. Or I'm sorry, thirty something year old guy having uh seventy five thousand dollars sitting in the savings account or wherever you had it sitting. But a lot of people don't even have like three grand sitting around. You had seventy five grand sitting around. So and, you must and, have thought, you must have thought like, Hey, I'm a, I've arrived. I got seventy five thousand dollars sitting in the bank. Like Well, I, I remember uh I, I was probably eight years into my military career. I, I ended up doing 22 years in the military before I retired in the Army Reserve. So when I, when I was eight years into my military career, I, I put in the back of my mind that this is extra money every month that I'm getting from the military. So what I did was I stopped spending my reserve checks every month and start using that money to build up a, a, a lucrative savings account. So So once I got my, my finances in order. Then I said, no, this, this ain't as hard as it, it seems. You know, I mean, but by the time I turned 40, then I, I, I started thinking that, hey, I might could be a millionaire. I never thought I, I, I could ever be a millionaire because no one had sat down and, and, and taught me, you know, the, the, the lessons and in compound interest and all that stuff. So I had to basically self teach myself all these different things about finances and, and wealth building. So, once I got to about 44, I'm like, man, this, 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 this could really happen for me. So I, I begin to get more and more enthused about, you know, saving every dime and investing every dime, you know, start cutting back things in my life, you know, no, no, no trips, no, no vacations and just kind of living a little more and more frugal to, to, to just reach this goal, just to see if it was going to even be possible for me. So. Yeah. Well, let me commend you, man. That's that's amazing to to realize where you came from and just just breaking free, like changing your mindset. Like that's really the first step because yeah. so many people are kind of stuck just on the gerbil wheel, kind of going through life and doing the same things over and over, not getting anywhere. But you you broke out of that and you know and started with a little bit of a shift and then kind of got that. It seemed like that shift just continued to grow a little bit. Where it's like, hey, maybe I could build a little bit of wealth. And you're like, oh gosh, I could become a millionaire. Exactly. And then you started working on that. And then all of a sudden it became more real to you. And I mean, that was just three years ago, right? Where you said you made the transition from just building a little bit of money to going, hey, I, I think I can do this millionaire thing. That was just three years ago. Exactly. I, I, I went I went all in on it. I went all in on it. And and think about it, you know, talking to other people that have, have you know, made the transition into, you know, becoming wealthy. You know, you, you feed off those people. So so they, they they have ideas that they bounce off off of you. You have ideas that you bounce off of them. And, and it's, it's almost like being in a, a network of people that, that are working toward the same goal. And that's financial independence and, and being able to have, you know, um, an inheritance to pass on to your next generation, you know. Because I, 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 I tell people all the time that the wealth really isn't for me. It's, it's, it's for my um, descendants, you know, to change the trajectory of my family tree, you know. Now, how many kids do you have? I forget. I, yeah, I have two daughters. I have two daughters, a 27-year-old daughter and a 21-year-old daughter. Yeah, and are either one of them at home with you still, or are they both moved out? 
they both moved out. Uh, my my twenty seven year old is, is an attorney here in Nashville, and my my twenty one year old is um, pursuing her MBA degree uh, in DC. Well, that's, that's awesome. I just, uh, you know, one thing I'm telling people these days is when you look at your kids, you need to start looking at them and realizing that you got a couple of future millionaires in your household, right? And exactly. uh, yeah, and I think for you and I, uh, we had to figure it out on our own and our, we didn't have anybody to teach us. My parents didn't teach me. Your parents didn't teach you. No. Um, we had to figure it out on our own, but our kids, you know, get to benefit from the, the mindset shift and the things we've learned as long as we're intentional. So I'm really encouraging people to start thinking about it that way. Like if you got, I've, exactly. got six, I've got six kids at home. So when I look at my kids, I'm like, all right, these are six future millionaires in my household. Um, I got to make sure I transfer and get them off on the right track. Exactly. Because if you don't do that, everything you've done is in vain because once they get your inheritance, it's, it's going to be squandered away because they don't have the capacity to manage that type of uh, financial responsibility. Yeah. The foundation. So you didn't start, you know, prior to the show, we were talking about, you, you know, your road to wealth and your road to becoming a millionaire. And, uh, you know, when people first start out, there's a lot of self-doubt. There's a lot exactly. of uh, confusion, probably, because you're like, well, mm-hmm. how, how do I do this? I can't, can I do this? How do I do this? What do I do first? And so I want to do a little bit something different with the last 20 minutes on the show. And let's just walk people through how you got started and your now, evolution, because where you start is not the only place you're going to continue when you go on this journey. It's just where you exactly. start and you're going to keep learning more and refining more, changing your decisions a little bit, improving. Mm-hmm. And so you're going to get wise. Wiser, and you're going to make better decisions in the future than you make at the beginning. But the, the key point is you've got to make the commitment and start the learning process so that you can get the other learnings and apply them. So you didn't start out with some mega stock, right? You didn't just get lucky. No. That's another thing I hear when, when you talk about no. somebody about being a millionaire, they tell you, they tell you, Oh, you guys, you just got lucky. You're in the right place at the right time. No. And that doesn't happen to everybody. And I'm like, well, that's not what happened. I'm sorry. You believe that, but you know, I had to work my butt off. To get exactly. You. Exactly. And, uh, and you did the same. So where did you start? How did you start? I, I, like I said, I, I started with um, the U S treasury saving bonds outside of a traditional money market account. So, so I started, you know, with the traditional um, saving bonds from the U S treasury department. And I did that for like maybe three or four years. And then I said, you know, the growth was, was decent. It was better than what I was getting in the bank at the time because of the uh, the market was down for, for the money market account. So then I said, well, I started Googling things and looking up stuff on the Internet. So then I, I started to say, well, maybe I need to get more into individual stocks. I, I never really uh, – I knew about mutual funds a little bit when I started, you know, kind of learning how to uh, transition into the stock market. But I want to have more control over where my money was invested in. So the individual stock, the direct investing was more, you know, appealing to me because I wanted to put my money into companies where like Apple and places like that where I you know, was using the products and services of these companies. So I, I had a, a, a good, you know, uh, 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 knowledge base about what the products that these companies were putting out. So I, I just basically started buying stock in, in, in Apple and Johnson and Johnson and AT and T, Verizon, BP, the oil uh, stocks and stuff like that. Just, just stuff that people just use on a day to day basis that that I feel like wasn't going to go out of business anytime soon. So I like what your approach there because that's one of the things I tell people is you want to buy something you're familiar with. So like when I'm teaching mm-hmm. my kids about investing, I just first thing I start with is, hey, make a, ten, a list of 10, 10 companies that you like and whose products you use and, and then go research Excellent. those. Go research those. So start with what you're familiar with and exactly. that you use. And then, uh, you know, some of those are going to wash out. Not all of them are going to be worth investing in, but some of them will be. And that's a good place to start. Now, you started with – very safe investments. When you say you started with bonds, treasury bonds, that's a very safe, or we think it's a very safe, as long as the government doesn't, uh, you know, a coup doesn't happen, the government doesn't turn over, that's a safe investment. But exactly. it's not a very high yield investment, like you were no, saying, it's a low yeah, no, Yeah, no, it's not. So, but, but I use that to, to be able to put my money somewhere other than uh, in the money market account that I feel comfortable with not waking up the next day and, and half, half of my return is gone. So, so once my tolerance level began to increase, 
then that's when I kind of start transferring money from from the bond aspect into the stock market. And 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 then and then once once I start seeing the the, the percentage of growth, I was like, whoa, this is I'm on to something here. So yeah, and then you got so you went you kind of bypassed mutual funds, which a lot of people are going to tell you to get into mutual funds because it's safer. But now I'll tell people like uh, um, you know like you said your your risk tolerance went went up, Cordell. Uh, exactly. But for a lot of people, I think mutual funds is a good place to start because it's a, it's a safer place. It gives you a better yield than a treasury bond. Um, and it, it's a it's a place to go on the journey, right, where you start to learn. And, you, you know, exactly. it's a little bit safer. You get a little bit better return. Um, and I think there are different levels of investors, and you're going to be yeah. at, at different levels based on the learning that you do and the education you do. And, and, and one reason why I, I bypass the uh, mutual funds is because – by being a federal employee, you know, we, we have an opportunity to invest in the thrift saving plan. So so that's a pretty, you know, stable investment platform that's offered for, for uh, federal employees. So, so I, like I said, I'm 100% invested in, in that. I, I put the uh, max in that every year. So, so I wanted to kind of get a little more aggressive with my investing because I wanted to turn money over a lot faster because I, I had a goal of trying to become a millionaire before 50. So I had to get in some, some more uh, riskier investments. Yeah, you had to get at it. You had to get busy. Yeah, but, and, yeah, and I think that's a good correction is to say, hey, um, you know, if, let's say you had uh, – let's just draw hypothetically out here. Let's say you had um, two grand a month. Let's just use number two grand. Yeah. So you had a certain amount of that that was going into the thrift savings plan, which was your safe investment, which is – Exactly. Yeah, and let's say it's a 1,000. You can correct me on your ratios, but let's say it's a 1,000, and you take another 1,000 or whatever that number is and put it into different stocks and things that you're, you're buying up. And exactly. so you're, you're basically splitting on, hey, I'm putting some safe money over here. I put some risky money over here. Exactly. And that's actually how I started too. I started with mutual funds. About 50% of my money went mutual funds. 50% of it went into individual stocks. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that's how I chose to curb my risk. I'm not telling the listeners here, your future millionaires out there, that that's the, the place you should start. I'm just saying that's the place we started. Um, yeah. It's not a bad place to start, but you have to you have to really be prepared for the risk and also do the the learning and the studying and the research because you can't lose all your money. Like people do, no, they'll exactly. lose it all. Yeah, you, you, you have to have a foundation, and 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 that leads me into my next topic uh, with real estate. You know, with, with the stock market uh, getting you know a lot more volatile the last year or so. Uh, last year, I, I decided to um, shift some of my assets into real estate to get that stable, consistent income coming in once a month. So, yeah, I, so I, I think that's great. Um, and I think real estate, let me let me tell you the way I think about it, see if you agree with me on this, but as I'm coaching people and talking to them about their money, mentoring them on their money, um, the way I look at it is uh, cash and stocks are paper, that's paper money, that's paper wealth. Exactly. And, and you can use that as a vehicle to build your wealth, but it's still paper. At the end of the day, it's still paper. Um, real estate is land. It's tangible. You can hold it. You can walk on it. You can cut the grass. You can plant stuff on it. You can uh, build yeah. a business on it. You can you have a lot. It's it's a versatile tool in your wealth building portfolio. Gold and silver are tangible. They exist in the real world. They're they're real. Um, you can you can actually spend them. Gold and silver has been money for over three thousand years. Whether you know the government implodes or not, gold and silver still has value. Uh, if the U.S. government goes under today, U.S. dollars are not worth anything. Um, and you've seen that throughout history is that governments come and go and the currencies come and go as well. So what I love about what you're doing with your real estate is you're diversifying. You're using paper to build your wealth, but then you're transferring that paper wealth into tangible wealth, which is land. And so that exists in the physical world. And I, I love what you're doing there. That's what I'm teaching people to do every day. Yeah. So, so I, I, I just basically just used a common sense approach to, uh, to what I was doing. I, you know, I, I didn't want to, you know, get too risky. You know, like I say, one bad week in the market and, 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 and you'll be pulling your hair out. So I, I want to count, you know, keep 50% of it safe and, and, and be more aggressive with 50% of, of, of what I had to play with. And, and, and I like to, um, quote uh, one of the uh, rappers Nas you know he said for every three dollars he saved one invest one and spend one 
Oh, that's so a great that, ratio. So, so that's that, that's I'll, I'll keep that in the back of my mind. You know that that, that verse that he says: for every three dollars, he save one, spend one, and invest one. Yeah, and you know it's funny that that he said that. I'm actually uh, trying to teach my kids right now, and one of the principles I'm teaching kids is exactly what you just said. I, I got a slightly different ratio. Uh, mine is uh, save one, uh, spend one, or sp- save thirty percent, spend thirty percent, invest thirty percent, but give ten percent. And so yeah. whether that's yeah. you know presents or stuff to teach them altruism, but um, but that way you've got a good ratio. And if your kids can come out of high school thinking that way, they're going to exactly. be they're they're going to build wealth if they can keep that ratio locked in their brain as they continue to increase their income, increase their jobs. Uh, they're going to get they're going to build some wealth for their family. And so I think exactly. I think that's great. I have to look up Nas. Now, one thing you mentioned to me on the show, we haven't covered it yet. But that is dividend paying stocks. So when you started buying stocks initially, you weren't buying like high risk tech stocks um, or high growth tech stocks. So there's a way to make money with stock market where you buy stocks that go up in value. But there's also a way to buy stable stocks that actually pay out what's called dividends. Now, you were doing some of that, but you were mainly focused on dividend paying stocks at first. Exactly. When I first started purchasing stock, I I was focusing on dividend, dividend paying stocks. That, that that paid quarterly. Yeah, so talk about that for the audience because that's not something we've really talked about on the show a lot with the previous episodes. Um, so in that portfolio, what were some of the big stocks like what we call you know blue chip stocks or some of these big yeah. companies? Uh, some of the stocks in my portfolio that I had that was dividend dividend playing stocks was Apple, uh, AT and T, um, BP, Procter and Gamble, Johnson and Johnson. Those are basically the ones that I chose to put in my portfolio and uh and, and all all those stocks pay anywhere from 35 cents to 65 cents um per share dividend and and, and what i would do uh, i wouldn't i wouldn't take the money when they when i got the payout i would have mine reinvested into the company so so I, I set my account up so whenever i got my dividend payments from those various companies they would just reinvest the um, dividends back into the company and so when you say thirty-five to sixty-five cents, is that annually or is that quarterly or what that's, was the frequency? Uh, yeah, that was quarterly, meaning every three months. That, yeah. that, you know how many shares you had, you multiply that by time, times thirty-five cents or whatever, and that's yeah, so how you much get, you get for about about close to three dollars if you're at sixty-five cents. So you get about three dollars a share every year. Yeah. Ballpark, um, and then just reinvest that back in. So you're just accumulating more shares. Accumulate more shares, and then you would get the uh, the price fluctuation. If, if if the stock appreciate astronomically, then you made money twice. Well, I hope everybody picked up on that because that's not something we've talked about on the show before, and uh, it is a good way to look at it because you know you can go after the high growth, but you can go high risk with those too. Um, yeah. If you're you know in the past, some people were invested in General Motors. Um, you know, General Motors went under a few years ago. The government bought out, you know, basically took it over and all the shareholder wealth was wiped away. So the debt people, people that were in debt got paid. Uh, the people that they owed bills to got paid, but the shareholders lost all their money with General Motors. And that, that's a big company, man. That thing's been around for a long yeah. time. And, and uh, that was the, there was risk there and people lost it. And, and, and one, of, one of the stories, I, re- I read a story about, about, about a gentleman uh, by the name of, of Ronald Reed. He, uh, Mr. Reed was a janitor that worked for for years, and and uh, you know he 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 didn't have any uh, stock expertise. He just basically bought into companies like General Motors, GE, Coca Cola, Johnson and Johnson. But my, to make a long story short, when when Mr. Reed passed away uh, a few years ago, his family didn't even know he was a millionaire. Uh, he, he was a janitor working a, a nine to five. And had a, had a had the ability to to accumulate a net worth of four million dollars as a janitor. So I use that story to tell people when they say, "Well, I don't have a lot of money to to start investing." It, 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 it's not the dollar amount; it's the percentage. So so if you say I'm going to take eight to ten percent of my salary a month and start investing that eight to ten percent, whatever that may be, you know, you start there, and as, as your salary increases, that eight to ten percent of your salary is going to also increase. So, so everybody, I feel like everybody has something to, to, to start investing for their own future. I mean, this is your own life, your own financial 
well-being that we're talking about. You know, so nobody's going to make it happen. You have to make it happen for yourself. Yeah, take responsibility and then, you know, pass it yeah. on to people. Yeah, so yeah. let's let's make sure we just don't gloss over that story you just shared. So Mr. Reed, janitor, uh, you know, at a company making probably, if not minimum wage, not much more than minimum wage, right? Exactly. Exactly. And uh, he, 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 how, he, he, when he, did he pass away? When did he pass away? I, I want to say it was probably about five years ago. Okay. But I, I'm not for sure. But I, 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 um, I read the article probably about three years ago, and I, I my I used to share it with my my former supervisor at work, and we talk about it all the time. Here's a guy that was working as a janitor. He 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 didn't make he didn't make he didn't sell anything. He just continued to just buy dividend paying stock. You know, he, you know, you know, back, back in those days, you know, it's not like now you can get on Robinhood and, and don't have to pay any brokerage fees or anything like that. Back in those days, you had to pay money to a broker to buy this stock for you. So, so he, he probably wasn't buying a whole lot of it at a time because you had the broker's fee that you had to pay back in the day. Now, you know, you can get on Robinhood and, and make these purchases on your own with, with zero commission. So, yeah. so it's, it's really no excuse for the modern day working person not to be investing in the market oh absolutely and uh, just yeah. to connect the dots there on mr reed's story i'm just going to fill in some blanks here but let's say he was 70 years old passed away five years ago so he's been working for um you know probably since he was a teenager um even if he started investing as a teenager which probably didn't happen but let's say it did um then he would have been investing uh, close to 40 40 50 years right around that time exactly um, i think you were correct yeah, 40 years ago, that would have been, um, let's say, like 1980s, 19, mid-70s, 1980s. And uh, minimum wage when I was working at 13 was like $3.35 an hour. So this guy didn't start out making a lot of money. He, did, he wasn't even making 10 bucks an hour. And no. he was able to uh, generate that kind of wealth, uh, $4 million. So I'm feeling a little shameful right now. And, 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 and the point I want to drive home is it's the discipline. It's not the dollar amount. It's the discipline. Time in the market and the discipline to, to put that money there, let it work, and, and, and don't mess with it. I think that's good. Well, let's, let's wrap up the show. Uh, I wanted to ask you what are the three kind of big principles, uh, but there's obviously a theme that you, that's coming out of you today, and that is discipline. It's self-discipline. So we'll just call yeah. that uh, key number one from, from Cordell, the, the newly minted millionaire marshal, uh, discipline number one, dis key number one is going to be discipline for you. Um, what are some other things that you say really contributed to you being able to build the wealth that you've got right now and where you're headed? Getting on a, a budget, sticking, sticking with that budget. And, you know, sometimes, you know, when you operating on a budget, you know, you're going to have things that you want to, you know, purchase the big purchases or whatever. But if it's something that you don't really need right then, you know, kind of put it off a little bit and, and, and set you up a little extra fund on the side to maybe maybe buy that something, buy that big purchase or whatever. So so basically discipline, uh, um, a budget and and just just sticking to it, sticking to your goal, setting yourself a, a tangible goal, something that that, that you that, that that's realistic and, and, and you can obtain just just. And my thing is, has always been this. Every year you should be increasing your personal network because if you, if you treat yourself like a business, you know, if, if a business is continuing to operate every year and, it, and, it, and it's not building wealth, then it's not going to be in business long. So you, 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 you're going to have to get you a good business model for yourself, you know, something that you can tolerate in terms of your investment strategy and, and just stick to the plan. You know, every year you should be increasing by a percentage. Just say anywhere from five to seven percent of your net worth should be growing every year. So don't 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 try to put a dollar amount on it. Just just put a percentage on it. So 2021 you should your net worth should have grown five to seven percent. Yeah, and I love just, that. I love that and you just, and you just you just every year you should get better and better, better so and better. Let me quote that for you. Say, treat yourself like a business. Treat yourself every, like a business. Yeah, if you if your business isn't growing each year, then it's going to go out of business. It's going to go out of business. 
I'm going to put that on the website, Cordell. Thanks for being on the show and sharing your story. I'm sure everybody, the listeners, are going to get a lot out of it. And uh, I just thank you for your time. I look forward to hanging out. We need to go back up there to the pharmacy and grab another burger. Exactly, exactly. I'm going to hold you to it. And this time, I'm paying. Uh, I'll let you. <laughs> All right. Hey, good to see you again, Tony. Thank right, you so much for having me on the show. The Millionaire Choice Show shares the opinions and experiences of people and should not be considered financial advice. Before making your own financial choices, please seek out a registered financial advisor or certified financial planner.